Good evening, everyone. Hello, are you all in? Um, and a very warm welcome to you all. And thank you so much for coming to this evening's very special event, In Therapy with Susie Orbeck. Uh, I'm Fran Barry, and I work in the publishing team here at Welcome Collection. Um, first of all, I need to do some quick housekeeping. And can I ask how many of you have been to a Welcome Collection event here before? Uh -huh. So about a third, two, maybe a half? Great. Um, I also need to let you know that this talk it will be recorded and uploaded onto Welcome Collection's page on SoundCloud. Um, and we think the, or, the audience questions are also really interesting, so we will include these in the recording too. So do bear that in mind during the Q&A. Um, we're also filming the action on stage, but we won't be filming anyone in the audience. Um, so we're so thrilled to have Susie all back here to give a live action glimpse of the nuts and bolts of therapy and a unique insight into her own process as someone the New York Times has called the most famous psychotherapist to have set up couch in Britain since Sigmund Freud. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> uh, to give you some background, In Therapy started out as a BBC Radio 4 series um, made by Whistledown Productions. And it was devised to allow us to get as close as possible to the experience of, and the process of therapy in an engaging, dynamic way without com compromising confidentiality of Susie's clients. And I'm something I'm sure Ian and Susie will tell us all about. And Susie also took us further behind the scenes in the accompanying book, In Therapy. And we just published this special extended edition um, in partnership with Profile Books. And the book will be available outside after the event, and Susie will be signing copies too. So. Um, and at Welcome Collection, um, we're always looking to challenge how we think and feel about health, um, the health of our bodies and crucially our minds, and to be curious and ask questions. So this event feels particularly fitting, giving us a window into a process that can often be necessarily shrouded in secrecy. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, In Therapy Series Director Ian Rickson, who's going to be talking to Susie. Ian and Susie, thank you both so much for being here, and over to you. Well, um, no pun intended, welcome. Um, this is an experiment because you're going to watch two live improvisations. A character played by an actress, Sinead Matthews, is going to come on and have a first session with Susie. And then I will talk to the actress, Sinead, while Susie goes out of the room. So you'll be in on what we're going to try and load into session number two. You're doing an out-breath there, Susie, but you'll have your own little coach over there, and um, life is an adventure. But these things can go wrong. I mean, it might just fall on the floor. So please just be with us in the experimental nature of the event. It's exciting. And... Um, here we are, there's queues around the block, the theatre's packed. Um, what I do as a director is try and tune myself into the unconscious of a play and the inner world of each character. And I started inviting Susie into my rehearsals probably 20 years ago simply to help the actors feel their way into the paradoxes and contradictions and yearnings of their characters. And that worked really well for, I'd say, you know, at least 10 years. And um, then one time Susie came in and I said, should we try some live therapy with one of the actors in role um, in a play we were doing at the National Theatre? And both Sinead Matthews, who did it, who's going to be um, the actress today, and Susie said, why not? And they did a bit of therapy in the rehearsal room. And then you just called me the next day and saying, well, let's take this further. Why, why was that? I, I want to say two things. First of all, I want to say thank you to the welcome. And the first um, person here in, in this new edition was the recording from last time at the welcome. It was the live event. It was a different actor. Why did I call you? I called you because... Um, over the years, I've tried in many different ways to try to show the, the feel of therapy, how it actually, how it works, how it doesn't, how it bumbles and doesn't. And, and um, I had an opportunity to do it on radio, and I thought the only way I can do it is with an actor, and, the, and therefore I need Ian as my director because he knows how to work with actors. So it was simply that. Mm. And then why a book? Because 
I think what we achieved in the radio programs, which were recorded for probably 20, 25 minutes and then we cut them, um, was that I was doing a lot of thinking during that time and it wasn't possible to share uh, on radio what the process was and it wasn't possible to show how the therapist is affected by the people who she sees. And that's part of, a, an integral part of the therapy is to reflect and sweat and get disturbed by the people you're seeing and to think about what that disturbance might be about or that impact. So I wanted to include that in, in here and my publisher was kind enough to say yes. Mm. On the radio, we get to hear that connection between you and your clients through the audio. And in the book, there's lovely space for your um, honest reflections on how it's going. But when I see you with um, a simulated patient, I can really feel how, you just mentioned it, sweat, what you're hearing, the tempo and rhythm of a session, the physical um, in, uh, energy of a person, and how you as a sounding board are so um, receptive, sensitive, affected by that very presence. So it's going to be interesting today bringing in a character and seeing the effect on you well, and Well, should we say something about the character? Sure. Because any of you who read the first series or heard the first series, will have encountered Joe, who came to therapy and really drove me crazy because she, um, and I, 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 will, I also think this was Ian's first attempt, so he loaded her with so many difficult things that would, I don't think, ever happen in a first session. I was ready to murder him afterwards. I mean, first she comes late, she doesn't have the right address, I don't think she lost her keys, but you know, it was that kind, her phone goes off in the session, and then I'm seeing her friend, which in the kind of therapy I do isn't kosher, I can't do that. So, um, so she then comes back m many months later, and she's in a worse state, but she's come back for a referral, which I had offered her. So. In the meantime, the friend, just to tell you what's happened in my mind, the friend that she, that, that I was seeing has moved to Australia. I don't know why she's coming to see me because it's quite a while after. I don't know why she's made the appointment. She, all she's done is get in contact and say, can I come back and see you for a session? Great. Um, I will go and get her while you're talking, actually. Okay. She'll come in. Okay. And the thing about Ian is he hasn't told me anything, right? He's told her a lot. They've probably discussed what's possible. But where we left her last time was that she was effectively homeless and um, sleeping on... She was house-sitting for her friends who were doing very much better. She's, she's playing an actor um, who's fallen out of work, really. And, but I was very impressed with her in the second session, which was quite a while after the first one, because she was very thoughtful and a lot less jittery, and I found a therapist who would see her for no money. So that's, that's the story as, as I know it. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> Come on in. Thank you. You know where to go. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> oh, thanks. How have you been? I'm fine. <laughs> Tell me about you. Yeah. Um, Would you like to take your coat off? Uh, yeah. Like, well, actually, things are better for me. Things are much better. Um, well, from the last time that I saw you. <laughs> Thank God. Um, yeah. Uh, I have somewhere to live. Uh, a flat. I live in Watford. Um... I also have a job, 
which is great. Um, sort of a series regular. Oh, yeah? What's yeah. the series? Um, Doctors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an okay part. Like, it's fine. Um, it's not, you know, creatively inspiring in any mm-hmm. way, shape or form. But, um, you know, but it's a job. And it's just, you know, I can pay the rent and, uh, you know, it pays the bills. So, you know, but that's really good. That's, um, that's good. And I have a boyfriend. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So that's... Uh, so that's me. Um, actually, on this series, um, I've got quite close to one of the producers. Uh, she's this amazing wo- um, woman. Um, she's sort of taking me under her wing in a way. She, you know, she's she's incredibly strong and um, forthright, and. So a few years back, this thing happened. Uh, you know the whole hashtag Me Too thing. Mm-hmm. Well, <sighs> sorry because I'm having to deal with a bit of anxiety at the moment, <laughs> and I can just feel it coming on. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Anyway, I need to tell you. Um, basically, I told her something that happened to me um, quite a few years ago. And basically, Equity, who is the actors' union, mm-hmm. they are... Um, building a case against this particular person mm-hmm. who I have I have worked with and I had an an incident with him uh, and she is encouraging me to uh, make an official complaint about him mm-hmm. but the problem is what I'm struggling with is that to me it wasn't sexual assault Mm -hmm. and I'm being told by a lot of my female friends that it is and I've told them about you know what happened Um, and I'm trying to come to terms with it and my relationship to it Mm -hmm. And I am struggling to see how it's her, uh, sexual assault. Okay. Because I feel that, like I let him do it. It was a party. Um, I was very, very drunk. I had, I, I just had my bag stolen. I had everything stolen. So I was kind of in that mood where you just want to get fucking hammered. Do you know what I mean? You, like, you, like you just go out to get very drunk. And, um, and I was sad. I was in a, uh, in a sad place. And in, like in a way, I could see that, you know, he'd auditioned me quite a few times before. You know, he would always spend quite a bit of time with me. And, like, I never got the job, but he would always get me in. And he would always... I thought he... Th- I thought that he thought that I was really talented. Um, and it's only now, with all of the... You know, the Me Too stuff, that I'm looking at it differently, but I'm still struggling... I'm still struggling to uh, to see how it's sexual assault if I let it happen. And I went along with it mm-hmm. because I needed it, because I needed human human contact at the time. 
I needed. He kissed me, and I kissed him, and we did more, and I think it's making me look at it differently. Uh, and I don't feel how these other women feel. Like, I don't feel, you know, strongly, you know, this... Um, I don't want to make uh, the complaint mm -hmm. because I don't want to put myself... I'm struggling with, with quite, quite bad anxiety at the moment, as it is. Because of this or because of the pressure you feel? It is a huge... I, like, I do feel pressure because I don't know where I fit in. I don't know, like, where I fit in within this... I don't know how to articulate it. Um, like, I am a feminist. Uh, but it has made me look at my relationship with my body and men going way back to when I was a lot younger. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I feel like it's all a bit blurred in my head. And it's not black and white, that it's... Do you understand what I'm saying? I think I know what you're saying, but I, I, I've got lots of things I want to hear, but... What do you think? Well, let me ask you one thing first. When you told the producer this, before the Me Too, you told her something had happened. Yeah. How do you remember describing it then to her, that then made her... Because you've obviously reflected a lot since mm -hmm. everything's opened up around mm -hmm. this. But I wonder how you presented it at the time, what you thought of. I think I presented it as what happened and also trying to understand w what it was. Because I felt like their reactions to it was stronger than what I was... So you were just saying en passant, and she took it as an exceptional... Well, having said that, I did bring it up yeah. in conversation because of it. You know, uh, it doesn't sit right with me, the, uh, the, social, the social media outpour. Okay. I find it really... So let's set that aside for the moment. Let's think about what's upsetting you, because... You don't have to do what this woman says. But what kind of woman do I want to be? Well, I don't know do that know we can answer I mean, that though? in five minutes, but maybe could, we, could, it, could we explore a little bit what... What I mean by that, though, is, you know, everyone's coming forward and, you know, don't stay silent and speak out about it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really... I feel like I take part in the conversations with them all, but I don't really, truly know how I feel about it. You mean you don't know your own story or you don't know how you feel about the conversation? Because those are two different things. Well, both, really, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think what it's doing for me is it's just bringing up a lot of stuff. From when I was younger, like, mm. y you know, I've always measured myself uh, how desirable I am to men mm -hmm. and I always have mm -hmm. and I don't know why that's just well uh, just you and probably 99% of other women but okay yeah. fine um, because I mean, at you the brought moment up I that. feel like that's a really bad thing or something 
Is it a bad thing or is it an expression of what you understood? That was a way for you to to manage things, was to look for that kind of recognition. Mm. It wasn't passive. I mean, what you said is, I wasn't passive in relation to this guy. I was. You were passive or you weren't passive? You said, I wasn't. He kissed me, I kissed him back. I just went along with it because I... Mm -hmm. Because he wanted to. And you... Okay, let me try and... Let's try and unpick it a bit because it's a bit... It's, it, I can see where it all gets jammed up in your head. So you want them to find you attractive... No, I'm not talking. I don't want him to find no, me attractive. No, okay, men to find you attractive, or specific. No, I men. don't want. I'm. What I'm saying is, is I'm saying that at one time that was a really nice, fun thing to be found attractive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that's how men and women sure. interact. It's fun to flirt. I've always been a very flirtatious person, I guess. But now things are getting blurred for me. I think that's what I'm trying to say because now I look... But more importantly, I'm talking about this particular situation and why I... I have to... Uh, work out how I feel about it because do I make the complaint or not mm -hmm. he has a family uh, there are many other situations that he's been in with other actresses Before we get to the complaint, how are you thinking about it? I feel ashamed. Of what happened? Yeah. That's how I feel about it. And I don't fully understand what I keep trying to say is I don't understand the situation itself. I don't know how these women can be saying, particularly about this, that it's a sexual assault because I was there and I still don't fully understand it myself. Do you understand? I, I, I think I understand. I just don't want to rush to say anything because I want to listen a bit more but I have I, well I kind of have to make a choice but I have I, but I have to decide whether I'm going to make the complaint or not by tomorrow and right now but is the problem that you'll have shame if you don't and shame if you do <laughs> yeah I think that's, that's what I mean by how will I be, you know, I've, you know, people know what happened. Well, this, maybe it's just this woman. I'm, I, I want her to, to, I want her support and her, what's the word? I want her to like me, I guess, in terms of... I want her to think that... I don't want her to judge me if I don't. Mm -hmm. So you want her to respect your decision if you decide you don't want to say anything? How much older was this guy than you? Uh, 
He was about 15 years older. Mm-hmm. And have you had subsequent, have you come across him subsequently to this event? No, not at all. I mean, I've, I see him and his work. He's, he's big news now. You know, he wasn't then, but he's big news now. Um, The word shame, has it been attaching to other incidents when you've been thinking back? Or does it only attach to this one? Yeah, it it has. It has, yeah. But in a similar way, another instance, I was a lot younger, and he was a lot older. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, in a really, this whole thing, I think is making a lot of women look at themselves and Mm -hmm. look at their relationship to everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I'm just struggling to deal with a few things that have happened in the past. Yeah, and I don't think it'll be a static thought when you come to a conclusion tonight about what you're going to do, because presumably... What would you do? <laughs> I can't possibly know. But how do you, how do you feel about the, about the Me Too, about the whole thing? How do you feel about it? How do you... Do, do you I'm really trying to think about what's helpful for you. I'm not really trying to avoid the question because I have a lot of different thoughts about it. What do you think? Because I feel like you just know stuff in a way that I'm struggling to... Like, if I did make that complaint Mm -hmm. and I... And then I was... The spotlight was put onto me and then how am I able to stand there wholeheartedly and say, yes, this is how it was? But I don't think that's what Me Too is about, is it? It's about the complexity of how things that happen are really not... They're not straightforward in these encounters. That's what I think. But and I think... If you're the only person making the complaint, it's impossible. You couldn't do it. But if there's, I think if you read some of the testimony of people who have wanted to come forward, but I would be a hypocrite because that's fine. So that allow it. That that doesn't that give you an answer that you're not. It doesn't feel right. You might have to live with the regret of not being able to do it. I mean, it seems to me you're going to have regret either way. Right. So maybe what we could allow you to consider, and it's not such an easy thing, is what's the principle of least regret in this? Use the principle. What's the what? The principle of least regret. What is the least regretful? Yeah. Because you mean, really that's are it, in conflict. I mean, that's what life comes down to. You are right? really in conflict. Which one am I going to regret less? Yeah. Oh, God. That that doesn't exempt you from trying to understand yourself and what it's meant and yeah. where the line between flirting and predatory behavior comes or, or when you're flirting because you don't feel okay and you want to be looked after. All of the things that I imagine are going on in your mind. Do you think I want to be looked after? I don't know, but I... You know, we've had that a little bit before, Joe, haven't we? And yeah. it's a perfectly legitimate desire that people have. But do you think, if we stop now, that you've got enough to be thinking of? 
I know it's not sufficient. I don't. I think we'd have to come back and talk about the actual experiences that are going through your mind. But I think you might have to reflect on them, not just tonight, but as you have been. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. And I think they don't stay fixed. I think that's what this is. You had one story about everything, didn't you? And now you've you've got other layers about you and your participation and what it meant and what you were looking for. And yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's the problem, though. I feel like I don't know my own mind. No, I, I think maybe your mind has got a lot more compartments or a lot more notes and tunes than, than just something really simple. Mm -hmm. And what you're scared about is that you'll be forced into a very simple response, which yeah. doesn't feel sufficiently authentic. Yeah. Does that make sense? That, that makes total sense. Okay, so I guess we better see each other again. Okay, yeah. Okay. No, I do think so, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. <sighs> that was tough. Pretty good. Okay. So we're going to put Susie in a uh, soundproof, soundproof <laughs> booth out here. I'm not going to hit you, but I sort of want to. Oh, <laughs> well, you always say that. I know. Right. Well done. <laughs> so, weird. so now we're going to, because part of this thing is story. How do you keep the story moving forward? It's um, interesting psychoanalytically what's happening. But um, it's usually most interesting when the story is charged up and there's paradox and contradiction. That's what reveals character. So I have a couple of things to suggest to you, and then you can piggyback on those. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered about this. You leave this room yeah. after this first session. You receive a call. It's him. It's the producer. He wants to meet you. He wants to talk. He wants to clear all this up. He's actually calling you. Mm -hmm. You go to the Charlotte Street Hotel. You watch him through the glass. He's with two other men and a young assistant or actress. It's raining. You don't know what to do. Your phone starts buzzing again. It's a text from him. Are you here? I think Janine, the producer of Doctors, is also calling you because you told her you were going to see Susie. What do you do? Now, one narrative is you leave, you go home, you retreat, you ignore all calls, you don't blow the whistle, I've got you late for a day's filming, feeling like you've let everyone down in that retreating, but a paradoxical freedom. Or you go into that bar, or you answer the call from equity. So I've created a little fork, a three-way fork in the road for you there. And a lot of the way I direct is, what's the gut of the artist, the actor, saying? Uh... Can you say them again? <laughs> you leave Susie's room. Yeah. Somehow your agent has given this producer your um, number. Or maybe he had it from six yeah, years he, ago. he probably he had it. He calls you. He says, look, I want to make this up. I know there's a lot of misunderstanding. Come and see me. I'm in the Charlotte Street Hotel. Okay. On autopilot, you go. And the shot I've got in the rain is of you looking through a window at him in the bar with the pressure, the twin weather fronts of his need, your producer's need on doctors, and where you are in that. Mm -hmm. What do you think she might do? Because whatever she does, we're bringing it back into this session with Susie. I think, uh, I think she would probably go in and then have an anxiety attack and leave. Great, okay, like, good. Like she would, yeah, 
there, the, you know, she would sense she would sense something from him. Yeah. And then, and then she probably. I I don't think he would be able to get everything out. I mean, it's whether he, she's going to confront him. Yeah. Before she. It's whether the anxiety does attack. Make the yes. Does the anxiety attack sabotage the confronting? Yeah. Or the connecting? Maybe it does. And then maybe you flee. And something that perhaps you didn't quite get enough attention from in the last session was, what am I going to do about this anxiety? Yeah, I yeah? think that's more important. That's so more important. you have your... And do you, does she then the next day say to Equity, yes, I'm coming forward, or not? What do mm -hmm. you think? No. Okay, so she doesn't do that. Are there reprisals from her producer on Doctors, or is that all fine? I don't think she's dealt with that yet. Fine. Okay. So you're going to go back in, you're going to tell Susie about the call, the anxiety attack, the messiness of that in a posh hotel, the not calling it equity, and your increasing feeling of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's also an undernote, because we like the contradiction, of a sort of freedom of not doing what anyone wanted, not following the male producer's need for mm -hmm. reparation, not obeying the pressure mm -hmm. from your producer, but it's mm -hmm. sort of vicarious. You feel both agoraphobic <laughs> and strangely free. But yeah. this anxiety is still going on. What can you do about that? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. yeah. And I think that thing that came up in the session about shame mm -hmm. and what you do with that shame, you could come back at Susie. How do you... Yeah, yeah. How do you process and lift shame? Okay. Good. So, just so wherever you sat, you can see, this may, not, this may be terrible. I mean, it's just an adventure. <laughs> We're just playing. Um, I'm going to put Sinead here, Joe, so you get to see it from a different point of view. Hi. Hi. Thanks for seeing me. Uh, well, I I didn't I didn't make the complaint. Um I actually got when I left here, he called me. <laughs> um, the producer, he called, and he wanted to meet up, which, to be honest... Wait, I'm confused. Which producer? Your producer or the man? The man. Because Sorry. I thought your producer was a woman. Sorry, I didn't Janine. I, that's yeah. my friend. Yeah, OK. And Jason, the producer... Okay. Um, he called me and he wanted to meet up and I just find well first of all that was just a bit it's almost like he knew that I'd been talking about him mm -hmm. it was a bit weird um, but anyway he called me and he wanted to meet up and he didn't really say but I could sense that, un you know, that underneath I think he might be have heard rumours. You know, people are talking about him. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, he was like, come to the Charlotte Street Hotel and we can have a drink and we can have a catch-up. And, um, and I went, I, I did go, and I saw him. I saw him inside and he was, he was with other people which is really weird, because why would he do that? Like, it's a bit weird that he'd arranged to meet me whilst he was in company. Anyway, that really threw me. I just thought that was like, is he playing some weird game? Are we going to sit there and like not talk about it, you know, but everything's going to be fine? Do you know what I mean? Like, he's just going to... It just all felt...
it felt wrong, actually. So, so I didn't, I didn't go in. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I think the problem is, is that I have a thought and then I have another thought and then another thought and it escalates. And so instead of dealing with the situation in hand, I'm dealing with anxiety on like, I feel a bit like it's swallowing me. Okay, so let's, uh, one of the things I thought about after we talked last week uh -huh. was that despite the anxiety, I thought it's so impressive that you're able to handle, manage all of these ambivalent feelings you're having. Even if it's causing you difficulty, that I think you're trying to go through all the different seams and not going into the hotel, having assessed it. But if I'd had a clear head, I would have been able to have, I think I would have made a different decision. Which would have been to go in? Yes, but at the, I'm overwhelmed by negative thoughts by sometimes quite irrational thoughts. Such as? <laughs> I mean, where do I begin? Um, well, with the first one and then the second one, or the fourth one and then the third one, or the seventh one and then the sixth one, I don't mind. Just give them all to me. Well, at the moment, like, I'm, it's, it's in my relationship. I. I can't, um, I can't stop the thoughts from leading to the worst possible scenario within my relationship. And he doesn't do anything wrong. He would do something which makes me think, well, that was a bit weird. He obviously doesn't love me. Oh, he's also cheating on me. Oh. Yeah, and he's trying to work out a way of dumping me. Uh, and, then, and then suddenly, I will be at, I would have gone from naught to ten. And then it affects my behavior towards him. And I've created a whole different narrative in my head. But it's not real. It's like a different it's like a different narrative, and I don't know how to, and I'm aware that it's not real, but I don't know how to stop it. And that, I, I need you to help me to. Was this happening before? I, I think in a way, it, it, it's been there quite subtly, but I haven't really known what it was. Because what I'm remembering from the very first time you came to talk with me, mm -hmm was the relationship had broken down in, and you walked away. Yeah, that was... And I was thinking, was it that whatever insecurity got aroused, which happens in relationships, mm -hmm. was so unmanageable that you couldn't share it and you walked away? That's what I, that was the impression I was left with. And now where you're needing somebody so much to help you with your confusions, you're kind of banishing him in your head because you're scared he's not going to be there for you. Yeah. I, I, do, I, I do weird things. Really weird things. Like, if he doesn't, I don't know, if I, if I text him, and my phone is making me anxious, and yet I can't live without it. I text him. If he doesn't respond within a sufficient amount of time that I think is the right time for him to respond, I, I delete everything from my phone. I get rid of his number. I get rid of messages, because I think I can live without him. I don't need him, and I literally remove him from my phone like he never existed and until he gets in touch with me again. Why do I do that? Why do you think? 
That's irrational, isn't it? Well, it's not the most rational thing, Matt. I agree with you there. <laughs> I just go, I don't need him. And then that means you're what? You're safe. safe? I'm I isolated. Don't, I don't and, need him anyway. And very, very anxious. That's how it feels. You don't have to deal with being intimate and disappointed. And yeah. He's being a pain or he's being... Or he's just probably going to dump me really soon anyway. So I'll just remove him. And yet he apparently really loves me. How about that? <laughs> anyway... Um, Not anyway, just let's need... just stay there, because... If you've gotten rid of him in your head and on your phone, that's you being, and it's probably not, you're not realising it, it's you being very rejecting. That's, that's kind of why I need help, because I don't want to push him away like that because he hasn't done anything wrong how do you do how do you stop the thoughts you say I'm scared you say that to him well depends how close you are you could you could say I find this really scary but you mm -hmm. could be saying it to yourself too yeah like, I don't think I know how to do this I really like this guy I'm yeah. really enjoying him, but I don't know how to sustain this. I'm a bit scared. I don't have a good track record with this. I've got record of disappearance yeah. or history of disappearance. I'm not so good at trusting. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you get good at trusting? I think that's what I... Well, I don't think you go from I'm not good at it to getting very good at it in one go. But, but how do you... And I think what's interesting, if I think about the woman producer that you got close to, mm. and you're feeling kind of forced by her, or under extreme pressure... I haven't told her yet that I haven't made the complaint. Right. So you're feeling under pressure there. So there's a the confusion about what will happen if you trust somebody but you have a difference or whether mm -hmm. you really can trust somebody or whether you have to, whether that connection will be broken if you find yourself in a different position. It's like you're living with a lot of fear. That's crazy, isn't it? The mind does really strange things. It imagines it's being protective, but it's actually hurting you. So how, I mean, do you have any exercises for me to do that, like, do, to retrain my brain? Or You know, we never even found out what happened with you and your other therapist that I sent you to. Because, oh, you know, having a relationship that goes on where you can explore trust and distrust would be a place. I didn't... I didn't trust him. I don't mean that, like, d like deeply. I just, I didn't like him. I didn't, I didn't. Okay. I don't know. It was, I don't know. Okay, so you know the problem of not trusting somebody you don't like, but what about not trusting somebody you do like? I mean, that's the issue that you've... I think what keeps coming back to me is when I was a kid, every time when my dad was around, when we would have, like, an argument or... He used to hit me on the head quite a lot. I think out of frustration on his part. Um... But whenever we had a thing, I would go into my room and I would pack everything up, like, and I would run away, mm -hmm. obviously, because that's what kids do. But I did it every time. I used to, like, pack stuff. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not staying here. I'm not, this is, from a really early age, I did that. 
at home with my dad. And now I'm thinking, that's... And what did he do when he saw you back? He wasn't really interested. When you came down with your little... Yeah, I was in the bushes at the end of the road. I mean, he was Did he come after you? Did anybody come after you? Did anybody... No, because I came back, of course. But that's... Because I came back. So he hurt you, or you'd have an argument. You'd get a whack. Yeah. You'd be affronted. You'd get out. You'd. Yeah, I would go into like survival mode. Get everything and go. And I feel like I've done that in my adult life as well. Well, so that you're in charge of the leaving, except you come back. Yeah. So with your boyfriend now, you're leaving him in your head all the time. Yeah, all the time. We're done. So you're not really present, because you've left. Obviously not. But I get... It's because I get this anxiety... I mean, at least I think it's anxiety. Yeah, I'm interested. You use the word. I want to know what 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 is it? Is it the thing where all the thoughts just? It's 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 overwhelming, bad thoughts. My arms go like they're like there's nothing inside, and I can't. I get. I can't concentrate on anything else. I can't. If I'm having it and someone tries to have a conversation with me, I'll be so trying to deal with those thoughts. I don't know. But what are you feeling? You feeling unsafe? Are you feeling insecure? Insecure, everything. Like fear. So you you make I think it's you text him, you don't hear from him, you feel unsafe. Then you feel hurt. Then you feel angry. That's so irrational. Don't you think? I'm not really interested in the rational. I'm interested in the feeling part. Okay. I think the anxiety is away from the feeling. The feeling sounds to me like first you get unsafe. Oh, oh I s- no, I see what you mean. Yeah, I feel scared. I feel scared. Yeah. It's a fear. It's a form of fear. But if you have the fear, you can breathe. If you have anxiety, you can't. Because fear is a feeling. You can see whether it's the right feeling. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to go straight to banishment. You could go to, wait, wait, I feel, I'm fearful. So it's like recognizing the feeling? Well, that would be a start, yeah. Yeah. I think what happens, you ask me what happens, I think what happens is you've got a log jam up there because you're into thoughts. Mm-hmm. I'm going to oversimplify. But I think if you could have the feeling of fear, you might then think, feel, well, I, might, I feel abandoned or I feel insecure yeah. or I feel nervous or I feel excited. Yes. Well, maybe he does love, but the, yeah. they, you'd have a whole series of feelings that you could digest, whereas the thoughts are absolutely not manageable because they just crowd out with only an exit point. I don't know if that's right, but that's. Do you believe in inherited anxiety? Like. Well, I remember you told me your mum was not that. Um, yeah. I think why. Even handed or. Um, I think if you grow up in a, in a situation where anxiety is a dominant 
affect in the place, then you're going to be very attuned to it and you're going to catch it, just like kids who only grow up being allowed to just smile and have to smile all the time, however terrible it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I w I've come to you because I've, I don't want it like I don't want to go mad. Do you know what I mean? And I feel myself sometimes. It's the thoughts are swallowing me. I'm not in control of the thoughts. But even though again, I what's impressive is the minute I say if you could go for the feeling, you calm right down. Okay. Don't you? I mean, you. Yeah, that's true. So, you know about feelings as an actor. Yeah, I think... But you've forgotten that you have them as a self. Or I you're not practised at them. Maybe that's part of the attraction of acting. Yeah. Is to embody those feelings. In a safe environment. Because you've got a script. And a stage and someone else's... Yeah. So would it make sense for you to consider that you might allow yourself some feelings? And, and to be afraid, and it's okay to be afraid. Yeah, and then see what else comes up, if something else comes up. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to stop for today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> God, that was a lot of talking. I never do that much talking in therapy. Yeah, I mean, it is a um, simulation, isn't it? It's not real, but it feels real because it's so heightened. Um, did the character Susie feel... What did she feel about continuing to see Joe? next week. I week didn't after. have any choice. I mean, that I think is part of the problem of being a therapist, is that you, you know, you've seen somebody a couple of times and they're in difficulty and you've sent them somewhere else and it hasn't worked out and that's it. But given the whole <laughs> session, we had this beautiful narrative towards allowing in feelings. Does the character Susie have optimistic feelings, beleaguered feelings about the future with I'm Jo? I'm not frightened by Jo at all, actually. Because I think she's very frightened. Yeah. Um, I just want her... I, 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 I want to invite her to expand her emotional... Mm. Uh, the emotional territory, which I don't think she's in at all. I think she's she's quite right. She calls it anxiety. I call it a kind of hysteria you're in. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that in a technical sense, but I think you're you're you, you and it's you you describe very well mm. the being crowded by. I was really surprised by that. I really liked it because we think things like fear eats the soul or Anais Nin said life shrinks or expands according to one's courage. But the permissive message of the character Susie was, well, feel the fear, mm. let it in. And that seemed to thaw Jo. Mm. And she seemed to, her heart rate seemed to go down a bit. Definitely, because I think she realised that actually what I'm feeling is emotion. It's not anxiety. Mm -hmm. And if she's able to go, I'm feeling like this now, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing. She's, you know, she's just feeling... Well, your whole complaint when you came in on the first session was, I don't know what I think about or what I want to do about this because I, mm -hmm. I have so many different conflicting and so we needed to slow you down and yeah. what you do is you race but Jo does that she did it in the very first session yeah it all just comes out and you also like to leave right in the first session when I tell you I can't see you because I'm seeing your friend you pick up your handbag and you start to go and I tell you to sit down yeah 
you know, now I know, yeah. n- now I know why, because you used to pack your bag all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. The phone detail. That's, see, yeah. that just, none of that's planned. It's all coming up in the live channeling of an improvisation. How do you alter the tempo of a client? Is that something you're doing quite instinctively mm. or unconsciously, or do you have tactics? No, I don't have any tactics. So how do you do it? I don't know. But there's 300 people here <laughs> wanting some tips. Oh, well, that's a different thing. That's a class. That's not, that's not a... Because mm. I felt your tempo slow. Yeah, I felt I slowed down. Which is lovely, yeah. Yeah. Or I just got less... I mean, in it, 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 what's interesting, if we were to look at the arc of this, is that I talk a lot, talked a lot more than I would. So I was a bit much more talky, as because it's 20 minutes, and I've got to yeah. give you some framework to quickly think that you can risk having a feeling in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. I wouldn't have done that. So I would have done that much more slowly. Of course. But I would have. I suppose if I have to be honest about a technique, it would be feeling, trying to pick up what I think you're feeling Mm -hmm. because of how it's impacting on me, how you're impacting on me, and find the right word to describe that, um, that feeling, those feelings. Yeah. It's interesting how the way we painted it, the kind of myth that there was the sort of king, the producer, the man producer, and the queen, the female producer, and then this sort of maiden in the middle of it, and who should she follow? Actually, that all fell away, completely unplanned, in the second session. It suddenly became about her and who she was and this boyfriend, and I really liked that that surprising journey. So what did you plan? Because I I thought that was amazing that he called. (laughs) I mean, not not surprising, not surprising that he called. Yeah. Because obviously you're not the only actor he's done this with, as you've said, and he's nervous. I'm not special. (laughs) Yeah, that must have hurt. Um, No, but... I just, I wondered, you know, I wondered about you going to the, had you scripted going to the hotel and not going in? Yes, but I didn't, we'd said that I did go in, and then I decided that I didn't. Mm -hmm. It's always good. And then actually, like, I realised why, because I didn't trust the situation, so you get out. But do you think that's post Weinstein, because of the stories about the hotel with everybody in it, and then everybody disappearing? Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah. No, like, yeah, like it was more to do with um, why is he there with, with other people? What's, this isn't, I don't trust it, basically. In a minute, I'm going to ask for questions. I just want to ask uh, one more thing. Um, I really was interested in a very early intervention where you said to Joe, it's impressive that you can manage your ambivalence, that you can hold two very different You mean, views yeah, at the I same was referring time. really to the first session. I was, re- yeah. Yeah. I just, well, could you expand on that? Did Joe hear that? No. No. But you heard a calm voice. Yeah. And I heard the word impressive, so I thought I must be yeah. doing something See, I really knew, well. I kind of thought that. I didn't think you would hear what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think you would hear it tonally. Mm. Well, I'm, I was doing something good. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> you were impressed, so I'm happy. I People wasn't impressed. Are. I thought it was impressive. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because... It's. I thought it boded well for your capacity to deal with a really difficult, complex situation yeah. for yourself and to be able to manage the difficulty of what was going to happen with you when you went to the woman producer and mm-hmm. said, you know what, I just couldn't do it. It just wasn't right for me. Yeah. Or I was going to do it, but I'm uncomfortable. However you were going to do it. Or I've, yeah. I'm d- I've done it, but I'll do it. I'm doing it in this way. Mm-hmm. In a way that's got 
the, all the riders on it that I want it to have. Mm. I'm going to ask for questions. And I've been advised to take two at a time, just because of the mechanics of mics being moved around. Should we do one on this side? I'll leave you to find whoever you want, and you could get ready for the next one. Great. Just They're not doing what you want. They're not getting ready for the next one. Uh, hello, good evening. I just was interested when you decided to intervene. There was a lot coming at you, and I'm wondering, was it um, a wait a minute, that suddenly you have an instinctual, mm, it doesn't resonate right, and you go in, or actually you're just trusting in the process, and wherever you intervene, there's going to be some therapeutic value. Great question. And let's have one, let's stack up one over here as well. Who wants to ask anyone on the right side of the house? Um, you, sorry, Susie, you said something. Um, I'm not frightened of Joe. It's Joe who's uh, frightened of feeling things. I just wondered in what situation you did feel fear as a therapist. Great. Really good questions. So the first one is um, how you instinctively time an intervention. And obviously, you've said already, the whole thing is concertinaed into 20 minutes. But um, let's start with that one. Well, I think in the first session, I really did have to have, she gave me her ambivalence right in the beginning. And I was supposed to deal with it, right? Do you, would you agree? I was supposed to go and sort it out. Mm. And I needed to find a way for you to take it back. I know that sounds paradoxical. No, it's good. But I didn't think we were going to get anywhere if I just did it for you. I don't know what you were, what you were expecting me to do. So I think I was expecting you to tell me what to do. Yeah. So I didn't think I could tell you what to do. And I didn't think in that situation we had enough time to reduce your anxiety, which is why I went for the principle of least regret. Because I thought, okay, you are very ambivalent, and there's so much more in this, and actually you don't have to be under the gun, and there's plenty of other women who are going to be putting their names forward. And um, so that's what I was... That's what I. That's why I didn't intervene very early on in that one. Does that make sense? Yeah, very good. And if your <coughs> body, your spirits, you are a sounding board for your client's feelings, oftentimes, the question on the uh, right-hand side of the house was, when do you feel fear, and what do you do with it? Well, I felt fear for Joe in her anxiety state of, you know, going down and chucking the boyfriend out already. And, you know, I, I did feel fear then. I felt that, I thought, okay, I kind of know what that is, but I haven't been there for a very long time. I'm really not like that. I was like that when I was a youngster. You know, that is, that is, that way is so hurtful because it just puts you in a loop and it means you can never be in a relationship and you never trust anybody and you're mm. just in a terrible repetition. So I feel that fear. Yeah. But I but I also felt it as anxi her anxiety. And um, so I was trying to give it back in a different way. When would I feel fear? If somebody threatens me. How frequently and frequently does that happen? Well, people threaten you in different ways. You know, they threaten your competence, they threaten you, they could threaten you by getting in too close, they could threaten you by rubbishing you, they could threaten, I'm giving you all the negatives. They could threaten you because they're a predator. Yeah. And they, there's menace in the room and you don't understand it. And you're on your own. You're on your own. <coughs> Did you feel fear from, you know, Joe when we first, first met? Yeah. Did, like, did Joe make No, I was incredibly you? irritated with well, you. Well, okay. <laughs> Unbelievably irritated. 
Because I'm thinking... <laughs> I, I'm thinking... That Not today. <laughs> this is, you know, I'm, I'm two putting years into ago. the scenes as much challenge as I can <laughs> so Susie thrives. If it's too easy for Susie, uh, you don't get the good material. Whereas if Susie has obstacles and difficulties, she tends to... Well, she always thrives, and then we get a good scene. But, but um, what was it... Can I yeah. say? All of the therapist friends of mine who heard that, because before it got transmitted, I had to sort of play it to a few people and they were all say, fucking going to kill her. I mean, you know, how did you manage to stay sane with her? You know, how did you manage to have some equilibrium with her? So you drove everybody crazy. Now, I'm sure they would have all been fine in the room because that's what therapists do do. Yeah. But in the hearing of it, they were all like, ah! Yeah, because we had set up quite a lot of... I rang her up obstacles. in the session, didn't I, as yeah. boss, and there was a cup of coffee, and there was a whole series of, you got blamed for giving the wrong address, yeah. etc. Interesting. Now, who wants to ask another question? We've got about ten more minutes. Great, we've got one down here, we've got another one down here, So, and then we'll go back up. Hello. In the front row, and in the second row. Oh, I'm here. Here. oh, there was another one. Oh, thank you. And we'll come to you after. Thanks. This is just a kind of practical question, but I'm interested in that you take notes. Yeah. Do you normally do that in your therapy sessions? I do in the beginning. You say, I'm, for A, I'm very old. <laughs> and I really don't know what I will remember until a certain period of time, and then I don't take notes. I mean, I can take notes for myself afterwards, but in the beginning, I have to. I just do. Right. Thank you. Hello. My question is about the difference between fear and anxiety. And if you are in fear too much, your body then starts to take fear of the fear. And that, to me, is anxiety. Yes. I don't I know think, if it's true or not. I think, look, people experience it differently. But what I was feeling with Joe in this particular in the way that she was expressing herself is that there was no texture in anxiety except anxiety, whereas I think she would have had texture, she would have had fear, she would have had worry, she would have had dismay, she would have had um, sorrow for herself. She would have had, once we got in there, she would have been able to expand and feel God, I'm quite insecure, and I really wish I wasn't. And I, I, I think it. So I don't think we would have been stuck in a fear loop. I think once we got there, we would have been fine. I really like that because it felt like Jo felt she was just playing the middle octave on a piano. Anxiety, anxiety, and it felt like what happened was you opened up the octaves. Yeah. So there's lots of other feelings here. You know, <coughs> loss, fear. Worry, joy, distrust, etc. Yeah. And I think she's really probably cool. read too many self help quotes on Instagram and she's like overloaded with, I've got anxiety, I've got anxiety. Yeah. Like, oh my God, help me get rid of anxiety. This, this sort of flip diagnostic mm. culture. Hello. Um, I was wondering to what degree your political, your politics comes into the therapy room or because with the Me Too thing, Part of me was like, oh my God, that's so that's so politically charged. Of course you have an opinion, you must have an opinion. Or is therapy your kind of, uh, is, is therapy your politics in a way? I hope it's not my politics, but I hope it expresses my politics, but it's not a political activity. And I certainly in the beginning, the first week of Me Too, everybody came in and, um, it wasn't any different than everybody coming in over Trump. So I certainly wasn't going to keep Sturm. I was like, yeah. And I think what's been really interesting is been watching the backlash, not the subtlety of what um, Joe was trying to raise, which was really, this was too compressed for that, but the, um, the backlash against somebody who was really virulently furious with somebody in the industry against um, Weinstein and then a few weeks later saying it's all gone too far. With, and I, was, I really got in there with, wait, how do we go from position A to position B? You know, in, in a millisecond really, because that doesn't require thought or 
So I think the thing about being a therapist is there's a lot of politics to therapy. The, 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 the way, A, your attitude, B, the way your empathy does or doesn't come across, whether you take up, what issues you take up, how you ask your questions, what you emphasize. Um, but you're always learning because as a result of Me Too, I've learned, I mean, the, the responses from the people that I see, from their own, ex it, it, that wasn't a strange experience, not, not, not Joe's exact experience, but feeling I was assaulted, but I do, I'm carrying the shame of the person who assaulted me. How do I separate out that shame from their shame? Is it their shame? Is it my shame? That's one thing. Or I can't bear it all because mine is such a private thing and there's all this public hullabaloo, so I'm feeling overstimulated by it. So, I, I mean, all of that what's, is what's going on in my practice, in a, very, in a section of my practice at the moment. In the weeks to come, um, because in the first session today, that word shame came up. It felt like the sort of hottest emotion yeah. in the room. And um, there wasn't time for you to address Joe's shame. And, you know, it's said it's the hardest of all feelings to bear. It's a very general question, but how would you set out trying to sort of diffuse that fear? Oh, that's just shame. In well, I don't Joe. know, because I don't know whether it was whether she didn't have sufficient compassion for herself as this person whose form of agency as you were a youngster was to get out or flirt or or mm -hmm. want to be adored right mm -hmm. and there's a certain amount of distress around that so i'd want to so i don't know if shame was in there i would have you know, I think in time we would have discovered. But I, what I just said, were, was she carrying also the shame of the guy, this particular guy? You know, what, because we know that happens in child sexual abuse, that the children are often left with the shame of, what is, of, of their perpetrator. Now, this wasn't a child thing. You, he was, you were both adults. Mm. But there's something in his easy sleaziness that might have contaminated you yeah. apart from your own misery on, yeah. and you're looking for comfort but were you looking for that kind of comfort that's great is there a burning last question one in the front row and you do you're you, and one well, in the you're back you're laughing I, I, yeah, I'm burning. You're burning. <laughs> and there's somebody in the front too, if you want to bring the other right. mic. It, it might be a quick one. Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so, Ian, you were saying earlier there's the 300 people uh, waiting for tips, and certainly there's a lot of practitioners in the room um, wanting to gain insight. Um, but is there any value to clients to, to gain insight into like back of house? process of, of therapy um, or, or gaining insight into other people's experiences in therapy. Does that make sense? I'd ask you, what, what do you think? <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of nervous about, I don't, I feel like not really, but I'm not I, sure. I mean, I know Susie was absolutely engulfed by people wanting therapy after the radio series and it's very liberating because it's just two people engaging isn't it and in a kind of human interaction so I'd say that would be in theory very emboldening for the clients but uh, I mean, but you know every therapist but I want to respond to that because every therapist um, has to be in therapy so they get back of the house and the thing is, it doesn't matter what you read. It, the experience doesn't matter whether you're theory-driven or you're um, process-driven. It doesn't really matter. When, you're, when somebody says something to you in the room, the therapist says something to you, or you say something to yourself in the room with a therapist, it has a completely different weight. So it doesn't demystify 
I mean, it might, you might have the whole process demystified, but the experience is still powerful. Great. Um, you've sat here in quite a hot room with such great It was focus. one other person. Right? I know, I'm going to go to the last. Did you, do you still have a question? Great. Um, I just want to say to Sinead, I mean, what is that like? I was quite nervous. It um, is quite nerve-wracking. How, how is it doing that live with, the, with a big group of people? Yes. Because in a radio edit, we can sort of, if you stop, I mean, we actually didn't, but we can sort of cut around it. Mm. But here, there's no, trape there's no safety net under the trapeze. Yeah, I've not really experienced anything like this before. At the beginning of the first one, I felt slightly, where am I? So I had to just readjust slightly. And you, you just have to stay on track, really, and just... I've done a lot of improvisation, so I was just kind of trusting that and trusting this yeah. and hoping that we would, you know, and also there's a, there's a fear of slipping into your own world mm. because you're here, <laughs> you know, I'm not in therapy, but maybe I should be, like, <laughs> I don't know. It, like, it's just really, so it's a really interesting dynamic for me, I've, you know, to do that um, and to take part in it, well, you know. You did and a brilliant job. Absolutely. Kept yeah. so inside. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a very, very um, small question. I was just very curious to know who this lady is. She, that, that she's my friend. You. She's your friend. And she and I were, have worked together for 41 years. So when you went out, you were we discussing the case. Chat you were having a chat out about the case. Yeah. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Splendid. So I realize, that's a really good question. It's a bit mysterious. No, well, I said, I, I was reminding yeah. Sally Berry, who was um, clinical director of the Women's Therapy Centre. I was saying to Sally, um, and she was the first person that we hired for 15 pounds a week in 1976. Um, we, we, I, said, I said to her a little bit about who Joe was, and reminded her, and we talked about her ambivalence and how impressive it was really, didn't we? And, we just talked. Mm -hmm. It was, it would have been like, it wasn't supervision, but it was a way for me to just mm. check I'd heard what I heard. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I used Sally, you know, in a, ruthlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever you do, I mean, if people were, if 300 people were watching me direct, if you're a plumber and you've got 300 people watching you fix that u bed, it's so difficult. Oh, so it's horrible. It is this. horrible. I don't and like it be... because I don't want to act. Yeah, but I don't want to play to you, and <laughs> except if I'm looking but, at you, then I'm perfectly prepared to play to you. But, but let but, me finish the compliment. Okay, oh, shut up. You um, did that with such um, generosity and openness, and it was such a powerful hour and a half. I'm going to say it. The book is out there. Oh, my Buy God. It. Thank you for coming. Well and done, what Susie. about, can we say, and go to see the birthday party, oh, which no. Ian has, is, is on stage right no. now and is a brilliant production. No.